Hey, this is Mike Ruzioni telling you to go to Blue Line Hockey Club for a great podcast. Hey, welcome back to the Blue Line Hockey Club, folks. We got another exciting episode tonight with the Blue Liners. We got episode 97 tonight. We got all the usual suspects sitting in the house tonight. We got our producer, Patrick Uncle Sullivan. What's up, Patrick? Aloha. And our local IT guy, our nerd on staff, Robbie Pete Peters. What's up, Pete? Hey, how are you, Mama? And the all around sports guru, Derek D Train. He too. What's up, D Train? What's up, Sweeto? And your host of the Blue Line Hockey Club tonight, Mark the Doctor Morley. Oh, yeah. Hey, fellas, we got a very special guest sitting with us tonight. We have the captain of the 1980 USA. Olympic team, the Miracle on Ice story, uh, one of the most iconic sporting events of all time for the U.S. Um, great to have Michael Ruzioni on the show. How you doing, Mike? I'm doing fine, guys. How you doing? Hey, we're doing great, Mike. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to have you on. Uh, the, the four of us grew up in a place called Canton, New York, about an hour and a half from Lake Placid. So we've been up there and skated in all the rinks and played in the 1980 rink and uh, what an experience that was as a kid um, to look up to you guys in the 1980 team um, i mean it's just uh, a great place for us to play hockey as kids and to be to have a little bit of a part of that um in our minor hockey careers and uh, lake class is such a great town so oh i like you know what i, I i'm sorry I, I was gonna say i, I love lake placid uh it's a special place, obviously, for me and my teammates. But even you know, 40 years later, whenever I go back there, it's pretty special. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, it, it's just. I mean, I, I'm sure you've done a million interviews about the uh, about the 1980 Olympics, and um, you know, obviously, just a iconic thing for the U.S. and for hockey in general. Um, you know. What, what's it like? Just tell us a little bit. Tell us some listeners, like, basically, what what kind of uh, questions do you get these days now that, you know, it's been, you know, whatever, 40 years? Ah, God, you know what? 40 years, I probably answered every possible question you could, <laughs> could ask me. Um, you know, just, you know, what it was like, uh, what it was like to be in the Olympic Games. Um, I, I, I think sometimes I... I get a little, I'm not saying frustrated, that wouldn't be the right word, because the Soviet victory was so great, but people forget about the Finland game. Um, you know, everybody thinks we played one yeah. game. They think we just, you know, we beat the Soviets, and that was the Olympics. And people don't know that on Sunday morning, if we lost our tide against Finland, heck, we could maybe not even won a medal. So um, as great as the Soviet game was, and it was an unbelievable, incredible victory, Boy, if we lose to Finland, you know, you guys aren't talking to me today, and, and, and nobody's <laughs> talking about the 1980 <laughs> Olympic team, other than it was a great victory against the Soviets. But so that, that's what I kind of I, I kind of look back on is um, it, it wasn't one game, it, you know. And I, I just I wrote a book that came out in, in January with a guy named Neil Baudet, and you know, part of the reason about the book was that my life wasn't one game, it wasn't one goal, it wasn't one moment. And I think our 80 Olympic team was that. It, it was, yeah, the Soviet game was uh, an incredible event. But heck, if we lose to Finland, I'm not writing a book and you guys aren't talking to me. So uh, <laughs> it's funny how, how things work out. Hey, Mike, just curious to, uh, you know, how many people confuse that game with a gold medal game when they talk to you and they actually think that was a gold medal game? Oh, almost everybody. I mean, everybody, <laughs> you know, I, I, you know, I, I, you know I, I, I get that story all the time. That, you know, remember that game and that game, that one game, that one game. And, um, yeah, I know it meant a lot. I, I know that game meant a lot. Uh, clearly to us as a team, it meant a lot because it gave us an opportunity to go to the medal round. Uh, to the gold medal game and you know our goal you know it's funny our, going in with the games we never talked about the soviets once it wasn't a discussion it was never brought about it was never talked about uh we had to worry about sweden and czechoslovakia and you know romania and norway and west germany we, we need to get to the medal round so the soviets weren't even a discussion until the night before the day before the soviet game what 
once we got to the medal round, we went, okay, now this is our next team. And it's, okay, it's the Soviet. How are we going to play against them? And that's really what it was like. It wasn't, you know, uh, you know, 40 years is a long time, and a lot of people bring up a lot of different stories. But, again, our, our objective was to get to the medal round. And w- once we got to the medal round, the objective was who are we playing next? And who we're playing next was the Soviets. So, okay, now let's prepare for, prepare for the next game. And that's really how it, it was pretty simple. It, it wasn't something that we went into the games thinking about or even talked about. Yeah, Mike, it's, you, know, you know, that's hockey. You just see even hockey playoffs, right? You go into each game. It's a new clean the slate. Let's, uh, let's uh, drop the puck. But, uh, you know, Mark was saying that, you know, we're all from Canton, New York. We – we uh, uh, been to Lake Placid numerous times. Um, every time I go back to Lake Placid, I'm always like, you know, I kind of just stop on the sidewalk and just imagine what <laughs> Lake Placid was like during the 1980 Olympics. Um, the streets must have been packed. Um, people just falling over, drinking booze. Um, <laughs> what was it like? You know, tell us what it was like and where you stayed and uh, were you guys able to go downtown yeah, I, and have a beer at, uh, you know, zigzags? No, Northwoods? No, no I, I wish I knew what downtown was like. Um, uh, we couldn't go anywhere. <laughs> I, I shouldn't say that. I, I, I don't mean it that way. Um, early on, we I, I did go downtown. My dad was there with my cousin, my high school football coach, and a bunch of friends, and they came up to the Olympic Games in a Winnebago. And early in the early in the Olympics, when you know nobody knew who I was, or who the '80 Olympic hockey team was, um, you would you would go downtown, and there was a place called Chair Six, uh, and I used to sneak into Chair Six with my dad and my my cousins and, and, and coaches and friends and um, not Olympic coaches but friends from Boston, and there was a great singer, uh, if I remember correctly, her name was D. And boy, she was hot. She was beautiful, and she could <laughs> sing. And I used to, I used to go to chair six because I loved to hear people sing. And uh, I would sit in the back and listen to this girl D sing, and and, and then I would kind of get up, go away, and go back to the village. Uh, and then after Czechoslovakia, and after Norway, and after Romania, we couldn't go anywhere downtown. The, you know, all of a sudden, people knew who the hockey team was or who I was, or who my teammates were, although some were a little more discreet, and, and basically stayed in the village. You, you really didn't go anywhere. You, you stayed in the Olympic Village. You couldn't go downtown um, because, what one, you, you know, you had a game to play the next day or whatever. So so basically, uh, the Olympic Games were, were spent, for me, in the village, um, and then sneaking over to Chair 6 to listen to the girl, you know, this beautiful girl, <laughs> Dee's, Thing, and and that what what it was like until you know the Soviet game and you know in, my, in actually not to promote my book but in my book I talk about the night before the Soviet game I promote it I went to campsite with my dad and uh, my cousin and I had a state police officer drove me um, from the village to the village to the campsite which is about ten or twelve miles outside of Lake Placid. Uh, my dad and my cousin and my my high school football coach and friends um, had a Winnebago and they drove the Winnebago to Lake Placid. So the night before the Soviet game, I I went to the campsite and my dad played the guitar and we sang some songs. I had a couple of beers and <laughs> stood there, nice. you know, stayed a couple a couple hours there, and then the state trooper brought me back to the village. Um, I went to bed and got ready for the game and stayed. So I didn't have any, any, uh, you know, fancy downtown Lake Placid stuff because uh, after we started winning, we basically couldn't go anywhere. Yeah, Mike. Listen, you sound like oh, okay. you could. Uh, you sound like one of us, man. That, that would have been like how we uh, got prepared for a big game, honestly, too. I probably would have had a few beers and uh, hope for the yeah, best. Yeah, well, I never. I, I, I. I I didn't want to do anything different. I didn't want to change, um, you know, what, what I would have done before a game. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't, you know, four o'clock in the morning drinking crazy passed out. I, I just thought sure. it'd be nice to spend, I thought it'd be nice to spend the night before the game with my, with my family and, 
have a couple of beers and relax and, um, you know, get ready to play the next day. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. I yeah. totally agree. Yeah. But um, if we could, you know, because like, like you say, because everybody always focuses on that uh, Russia game, like it is the gold medal game. And obviously it was not, would you mind talking about like leading up to, you know, before we get into that game, you mind talking about leading up to that game. What, what was like the biggest challenge you guys faced uh, leading up, you know, to the Russia game to even get into that medal round? What, did you, do you have a particular game that really tested you guys that maybe um, kind of, gelled you guys as a team that that pushed you kind of propelled you into that game yeah i think each game was a different challenge i, I, I mean clearly going in the games nobody thought we could win nobody thought we could 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 you know advance to any level let alone the gold medal game um but i think as a team we, we went into the tournament with the hope and uh, and thoughts of one you know again the old adage but one game at a time and you know, we played against Sweden before the games opened, and we were excited and confident. We thought we were a pretty good team. We were playing pretty well, uh, other than, you know, the loss to the Soviets in that last exhibition game, which, it's funny, was never talked about. But we finally got to the Olympic Games, and um, we, we thought we had a chance to, 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 to play well. And, you know, we, we go to Sweden, the Sweden game, and we didn't play very well against Sweden. Um, but Billy Baker scored, it, I think, probably the biggest goal of the Olympic Games um, to tie tie it at the end. And the the goal that Baker scored, I mean, the confidence level was, hey guys, we didn't play really well, and we got a tie against a team that you know we weren't supposed to beat. And then then the Czechoslovakian game, the only team that anybody thought that could beat the Czechs, we blew them out of the building. And that was the, the, the turning point, I think, for us as a team. Went, hell, you know, we, we can win, you know, we, I, I shouldn't say we can win this thing. We can get to the medal round. Because we, we had got three points against two teams that we weren't supposed to get any points against. So I, I, think, I think the Sweden game was a boost, but the Czech game was, like, push us over the edge. That, like, hey, guys, we, we can get to the medal round. Nice. So, so Mike, I know we're speaking with Mike Ruzioni, the uh, captain of the USA men's uh, Olympic team, uh, Lake Placid, Miracle on Ice. Uh, Mike, I know we, we've been talking about, you know, your, the players gelling and uh, downtown Placid, but, uh, you know, the one thing is Herb Brooks. You know, we all watch Miracle on Ice. Um, we uh, see how he's portrayed as the hard-nosed uh, coach. Uh, we all actually played high school hockey and kind of had it to me anyway, he's a hard, hard nosed coach, uh, like her, you know, you know, based on the movie, uh, was there ever a time where you just wanted to tell her to go stick it somewhere? Or, you know, I, I know in the movie where he made you guys get off the bus, uh, get your shit on and get on the ice, you know, was there a time no, where you, you know just wanted to say, come on her. <laughs> No, you know, it's funny. If, if, if you watch the movie Miracle and you saw Herb Brooks, uh, Herb was a lot friendlier and softer in the movie. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I remember when I first saw the movie, I went, that's not the same guy that I played under. Um, <laughs> but but let, me, let me say this. That's how coaches coached in the 70s. Um, yeah. You know, I, 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 you know I, I, I know you guys are, that, you know, the main background here. I, you know, I played under... I went to Burke Academy uh, for a year and played with a guy named Pop Whalen. And Pop Whalen coached uh, at Burke Academy, coached at actually Brewster Academy, and actually played at Boston University. Pop Whalen was one of the toughest coaches I ever played under. And then I go from him to Jack Parker, who was, again, an intense, in-your-face coaches. And then I went to Herb Brooks. Oh, no, I shouldn't say that. I went to Ted Garvin in Toledo. Then I went to Herb Brooks. But that's how coaches coached in that era. They were no in doubt, the sure. They were demanding. They challenged you. They pushed you. Uh, it, unlike today, you know, it's a little different. Players today are a little different than players <laughs> in, the, in, in the 70s. And so I, I played in an era with my high school football coach, my high school baseball coach, my high school hockey coach, obviously, and, um, you know, Jack Parker and, 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 and Pop Whalen and, and then Herb Brooks. And Garvin, they, they were all the same. They, they push you, they challenge you, they demanded a lot out of you. 
And here's the deal. You, you deal with it, you quit. Well, I ain't quitting. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to quit because <laughs> Jack Park yelled at me or, or Pop Whalen yelled at me or Ted Garvin or, or, or Herb Brooks. Uh, I can deal with it. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a big boy. Yeah. So it, it was, it was, that's how coaches were in that era. And, um, that's the way it was. In, in, in Herb's case, yeah, he was hard. He was demanding, but, you know, am I going to quit the Olympic team? <laughs> that ain't happening. Yeah, I mean, so, sometimes sometimes we need that, right? We need someone to yell at us. But that scene in the uh, movie where he made you get off the bus and put your equipment on, was that uh, – did you guys have to do that? Oh, the scene in the movie is um, when – I think when he challenged us because uh, he brought in Timmy Har. Uh, from Minnesota, uh, and, and we did have a discussion with him. Okay. He wasn't outside the bus. It was a little different scenario in the locker room or in his office. That was, uh, if you're going to cut me, which he threatened to cut me, I, I'm not ashamed to say that. And mm-hmm. he, was, he threatened to cut me right before the Olympic <laughs> Games, and um, I'm, I'm thinking, well, captain, no, he's going to cut me. I'm the, yeah, he's not going to cut the captain. But then again, uh, Herb, Herb, you, you never knew what Herb was going to do. So uh, but it, was, it was a challenge that we had to Herb was that uh, if you're going to cut me, cut me, but replace me with one of the guys who was originally on the, on the team. Don't, don't yeah. cut me and, and bring in somebody who, you know, wasn't even with us all year. So, again, I think that was sure. one of Herb's challenges, uh, one of his games that he would play. Um, just to see how close we were, and I think he got to his final answer. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Everybody you talk to praises Herb Brooks, too. So, I mean, he might have been a hard ass, like you, you they say. You know, that was part of the era. But when you talk to somebody today, you know, everybody seems to love the guy. Yeah. No, there's no question. You know what? Here, here's what I've always said about Herb. And I, 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 I got very close to Herb. Uh, somewhat during the Olympic team year, but more so a lot after. Um, I always said Herb was like your dad. You know, you love your dad, but, you, but sometimes you hate your dad because he makes you do things <laughs> you didn't want to do. You know, dad would push you and you'd be pissed, but yet you'd understand, you know, he's your dad. And, and, and I think that was Herb. Herb, ne- Herb, didn't, Herb never cared if we liked him, and there were a lot of times we, we didn't like him. Uh, but it was important with that we respected him. And there was never once a time we never sure. respected him. So, I mean, that, that, again, I, I'll use Herb, the same example as Jack Parker. I love Jack Parker. I love Jack Parker today uh, as, as much as I've ever loved the coach that I played for. And it was hard to play for Jack. And he was demanding. But I respected Jack and I trusted Jack. And, and that's sure. what's the important part about being a great coach. Definitely. Oh, I agree with you completely. Listen, Mike, I, I mean, so all of us played a lot of hockey under under coaches exactly like you're talking about, so we all completely agree, man. I, I, I think that's kind of – I wish that was more in the game of today that they had coaches like that and that players kind of could sustain that kind of coaching, but, you know, it is what it is at this point. But we all played yeah, under – Yeah, you're not, you know, not going to get, the, you know, mom and dad and players to kind of buy into that, so – no. It's a different era. <laughs> coaches have to diff- coaches have to coach differently, um, and I understand it. You know, we live in a different uh, a different time. We live in a different culture, sure. so uh, coaches have to be a little more understanding to the players and, and the players, uh, boys and girls, uh, and how you coach them, and and, and it's it's different. Yeah, yep. men become became men at a younger age back then. That's for sure. <laughs> they weren't living with mommy and daddy at twenty five. So, <laughs> so Mike, I know it was just your fortieth anniversary. Um, I sorry to butt in, guys. I just want to know. Tell us some of the cool things that you got to do. I think you got. To, did you get to go to the White House, or you got a you got to meet the president? Um, I saw you at no, a bunch of NHL think- games. We, we uh, the the uh, I think the the Minnesota kids got introduced at the Minnesota Wild game, um, which was cool okay. for them because half of the team, or three quarters of the team, were from Minnesota. Uh, <laughs> the the uh, the Las Vegas Knights uh, brought the whole team up to Vegas, 
introduced 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 us at a, a Vegas Knights game, um, which was the actual date of the 40th anniversary, which was awesome. Uh, uh, the Vegas Knights were off the charts. It was a first class event. Uh, they flew the whole team out there. We had a lot of fun. You know, some of my teammates. You I had guys didn't drink, did you? Yeah. <laughs> uh, we had a few, but not crazy. You know, it's funny. We, we, we're the most <laughs> lay, laid back immigrant. You know, we don't have a lot of party guys on on our team. It's, they, they'd rather go fishing and hunting than, than go to the gambling tables. But but we had some fun sure. getting together in Vegas. And um, um, you know, I, I I had the pleasure of the Pittsburgh Penguins brought me to Pittsburgh with Craig Patrick, our assistant coach, and we got some, you know. Got the pocket of Penguins game, and then the LA Kings had me out in LA, and I did something with the uh, LA Kings uh, to celebrate. But uh, it's it's nice. been a, just a nice, nice deal. Hey, yeah, Mike. Just to, sounds like a good time. Mike, just to touch on that a little bit. I mean, what has um, being part of that team, being a captain of that team, what has that done for you as far as you know your your life, and how has that changed? you know, where you are today. I mean, the sports has, gives you so many opportunities. I mean, if you never played on that team, you don't know where you'd be today. But I'm, I'm assuming yeah. that you're, you know, giving a lot of opportunities at that's, that. That's a great question. You, you, you can read my book and you can, I'll talk <laughs> about that. But no, I'm kidding. Um, no, it's just giving me an opportunity to do things that, uh, you know, I never would have probably have done. I, and, you know, I... I haven't changed. I, you know, I'm, I'm the same guy I was, uh, but I was in high school and college. I, you know, I, I live in my hometown. I married my, my my wife and I've been married 37 years. We dated for 12 years, so I'm um, 65. So put those numbers together. Um, I, I, I live two houses from the house I grew up in. I, my kids, my you know, I have five grandkids. My one daughter lives down the street with, with three boys. Uh, my son lives uh, about a five-minute walk. My other son lives only two hours away. Um, so no, you know, you know what? I, I haven't changed. The, the Olympics has given me an opportunity to do a, a lot of amazing things. I've, uh, I have a beautiful home that I live in. Maybe if I we didn't win, I wouldn't. Uh, you know, have a home, maybe have an apartment. I don't know. I'd, <laughs> I, I'd be coaching and teaching. That was my goal. I went to Boston University with the hope and, uh, of being a, co- a coach and a phys ed teacher. And the Olympics changed a lot of things for me. It's given me incredible opportunities. I, 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 I travel around the country. I do a lot of motivational speaking. I have some involvement with, with, with a couple of different companies. I do a lot of different things. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's all pretty good. But you know what? I, 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 I'm i not that deep a person. I don't think that deep about, oh, my God, what would have happened if, you know, <laughs> you never won. Uh, it's life. I get it. If we never yeah. won, yeah, life is life. And we won, and, 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 and Mike's life has been pretty good. And, <laughs> um, and I, I, I get that. I understand that. And, and it's fun. But I'm still, you know, where I am where, and where I should be is, in, in my hometown with my wife, with my kids, and now grandkids, and uh, it's all it, it's all kind of fun. That, that's and, awesome. and on the Blue Line Hockey Club podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think I've come in full full circle now. <laughs> I, I'm curious, like you know, I, I I read that you basically gave up, well, possibly gave up a professional career after the Olympics. Do you? Do you mind sharing, you know, what that decision was like for you? Yeah, I'm not sure it was about a professional career. I, I know I had an opportunity to play. Um, I had an opportunity to sign with the Rangers, who owned my rights, actually. Um, I was, I was the Rangers, Hartford, Buffalo, and Minnesota. Uh, but you know what? I, I At 25 years old, look, I had my opportunities when I was younger. And I went to camp with the Rangers I played two years in, in, in the International Hockey League. Uh, unfortunately, I think I played in the era where if you were an American or a college player, you weren't really given an opportunity to play. Um, I, I, I think 
at the Olympic Games, all of a sudden, the NHL looked at Americans and college players, not only American college players, but Canadian college players, as 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 an outlet uh, for guys who could play. You know, in my years, if you didn't play major junior, you couldn't play. You know, if you didn't play major junior hockey, you couldn't play in the NHL. So, you know, a four-year career at Boston University, I never felt I was given an opportunity to play, even when I went to camp with the New York Rangers and Colorado Rockies. Um, and I, I had some success, and I, I thought I had very good success when I played in, in, internationally. But after the Olympic Games, I just thought it was time to move on. I, you know, I'd, it's not like, you know, today nobody said, hey, Mike, is $50 million. <laughs> I'm not stupid. <laughs> um, I, 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 I just never thought my life should be determined by uh, having to be an NHL hockey player. I don't think you have to play in the NHL to, to say that you were a good hockey player or a bad hockey player. So after the Olympics, um, after some thought, um, I was going to retire, and I was actually looking to coach. I, I, I talked to Jack Parker about being possibly an assistant coach at Boston University, and then Jack said, let's talk in the summer. And then um, I realized that, that this, this moment was a lot bigger <laughs> than I thought or anybody thought it was. And then get into a lot of different deals and different venues, and um, you know, I still work. At, I, I actually work at Boston University. I, I've been there 27 years. I still do a lot of motivational speaking. I travel around the country, and uh, you know, uh, having some fun, doing a lot of different things. Like, like I said, I, ha- I have grandkids now, and it's, it's kind of funny. My my I, my my daughter has a seven year old, a six year old, and a five year old grandson. And and my son has a three year old and a seven month old granddaughter, and the three boys skated to Mike Ruzioni Center here in Winthrop, and they they don't know who Mike nice. Ruzioni is. <laughs> so don't say grandpa. It's Papa. Grandpa. It's Papa. It, 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 I, I'm I'm just Papa, so it's it's kind of fun. So you know the whole the whole thing yes. the whole thing has been um, it, it's been fun. It's it's been. An incredible uh, journey. It's not over, uh, obviously. But uh, you know, when we, when we talked earlier about this whole conversation, it was about you know the Olympic Games and the beginning of the what happened in Lake Placid, and I guess I've taken it 40 years later of, of uh, what it's meant to me and to my teammates and how special the moment was. Hey, Mike, while we got you on here, we wanted to uh, give you a chance to promote your book and just uh, tell the listeners, you know, you know how that came about, um, why you decided to write a book, a little <laughs> bit about it, and, uh, you know, where they can find it and uh, purchase it. Yeah, well, well I, I wrote the book for one reason and one reason only. Um, I want my grandkids to know that Papa's life wasn't one game, one goal, two weeks. Uh, I wanted my grandkids to know that, uh, and, and then maybe someday their kids, that their grandfather or great grandfather, uh, and, and I wanted my grandkids to know about their great grandfather and their great grandmother, that the, the work, the, the the hard work that that I put in. I mean, how I ended up at Boston University is an amazing story. How I ended up on the Olympic team is an amazing story. Uh, but the life I grew up with, you know, my dad worked three jobs. Uh, my mother took care of six kids. So I, I just think, to me, it was important to know that um, my life wasn't just one game or one goal. And I, I, I think it's on Amazon. You can buy it on Amazon.com. I don't, I, I, I'm not a real book person. Uh, <laughs> But, and again, like I said, I, I hope people buy the book. I think they'll enjoy it. I, it was a bestseller. It's done very well. But the reason I wrote the book wasn't to, to make money because there's not, not a lot of money in books. I just I wanted my grandkids to know my life and my story. And that was that, that's more important to me than, you know, if, if people buy it or don't buy it. <laughs> Mike, All where's right, that? Cool. Uh, Mike, where's the gold medal hanging nowadays? It's in the bank. 
uh, it's in the safety deposit box at the bank. Uh, I, I don't know. I, it might have been five years ago. I don't remember. I'm not that smart. Um, but I sold all my memorabilia. I sold the, you know, my jerseys from the Olympic Games, the hockey stick that I scored the goal against the Soviets, my credentials, my shoulder pads, elbow pads. I'm still trying to find my skates. I don't know where they are. <laughs> I think I know. Um, and They're hanging in that like zigzag point, uh, in Lake Placid. <laughs> me there. But I, I got like $1.3 million um, for all my memorabilia. And um, wow. I, so I sold it. First of all, I don't, you know, financial things are fine. I, I didn't sell it because I needed money. Um, I just, I have three children at the time when I sold it. And I have two jerseys, one hockey stick from the game. And I just, I wanted to um, give the money to my kids for them to do something with it. And I, I started a charitable foundation in my hometown called Winter Charities. In, in memory of my mom. Um, and then uh, I gave the money to my kids and my, my daughter bought a house and my two <laughs> sons that basically still kind of have some of that money to use at their, at their nice. discretion for things that they might need. So the medals in the bank, uh, the ring that, we, that, that, that I got um, uh, from the Olympic Games, I gave, my dad wore it and so he, so he passed away at 95, and I gave that to my son to hold on to. And then the Olympic ring that we got is is in the safety deposit box. So the things that will never be sold while I'm alive are the ring and the uh, and the uh, and the gold medal. When I die, if they want to sell it, that's up to them. But my two kids will make that decision. <laughs> What kind of stick was it, Mike? Do you, do you remember what kind of stick what, that you used? I was an orphan. Yeah. I, 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 there you go. There's no orphans anymore. I, I used an orphan <laughs> stick. Uh, and I think, the, I think the stick, I think the, I think the, I think the stick from the, uh, of the game that I scored, the game winning goal, I think that went for like, Four hundred thousand or something. Holy shit! Oh, yeah, that was yeah. me. I bought it. So, Most it expensive Northland attic. ever. It was in my attic. It was in my attic uh, with all my equipment sitting in the trunk. So, Isn't that I don't, it didn't make sense for me to have it. I, I, I had three kids. I have three kids. I got two jerseys and a hockey stick. I'd rather give the money to my kids and let them. Uh, you know, have something for their future. Hell yeah, Mike. Sure. Mike, Mike, I'm curious. When was the last time you were on the ice? Ah, uh, you know what? I uh, I'm 65, so I, I I'm not on the ice. Um, uh, I, I help out with our high. I help out with our high school team at Winter <laughs> Pie. I've been doing that. Shit, I've been I've been doing that even since I was when I played at Boston University when I. When I had a break at BU and we had Christmas break, I'd go out with the high school kids, and that's 1974. Um, and then even after the Olympics, I, I would go out, and I still do now. I, I, I'm kind of a volunteer assistant. So I'm, I'm on the ice with the high school kids, but I, I don't skate. I pass the pucks, you know, stand in the corner. And the head coach, Dale Dunbar, was a great coach, uh, uh, you know, Dale tells me, you know, is it his where to go to pass pucks? He, he, it's his team, it's, it's his practice, and I go on the benches once in a while for games, but I, I don't get involved. Uh, now that the grandkids are skating, I, I do skate once in a while with the grandkids on on like a Sunday morning. Uh, I put a rink in my backyard this year, which unfortunately was. Not a very good year for skating in in, in, <laughs> yeah. in, in, in Boston. So I got to skate with them a couple of times in the backyard, but uh, that's about it. No, I, I'm I'm uh, look, I, I'm I'm old. I don't skate that well anymore. Well, I can skate. I can't shoot. I can't do that. But <laughs> it's fun for me to be on the ice. With, you know, if I can get on the ice with the grandkids, that that's kind of fun for me. How about golf? Has you transitioned to golf like everybody else? 
No, I played a lot of golf. Yeah, I used to be good. And I, I don't play that well anymore. I think I, I, the lowest I was was a three. Wow. In cap, and I think I'm about 10, 10 or 11 right now. And You're pretty good. Uh, I, you know what? I don't care. I, can, I, I told someone the other day, I I don't hit it as far. I don't putt as well, and I don't really care anymore. If I, if I play well, I play well. I'm, I'm, I know one thing. I'm a good partner. You want to... You, you want a four ball partner? You, you're going to get a good one because I, I, I compete pretty well still. But you know what? Golf is golf, and it, it's it's like everything else. You get a little older, and uh, you just can't can't do the things you used to. Other than Tiger, <laughs> you can't you can't do the things you used to be able to do. So I, I just like going out and playing. Oh well, yeah, that's for sure. That's cool. We're all hackers, and we try to play good golf. But man, it's a tough game. Yeah. Yeah, Mike, we, on nine. <laughs> hey, Mike, we appreciate okay. you taking some. Go ahead, Rob. All right, thanks, guys. I scooped on a seventy on nine, Mike. So you're okay. <laughs> hey, Mike, thanks for coming on and taking some time to uh, right, rem- reminisce a little thanks, bit thanks. and uh, tell us your story. We appreciate it, man. You got it. Thank you guys for having me. And uh, like I said, make sure we tell Jordan and his brother I said hello. Will do. Yeah, Absolutely. we will. All right, take care, guys. Thanks for having me. It's an honor. Honor. All right, boys. Uh, great, great interview for the Blue Liners tonight. Another epic interview. Blue Line Hockey Club to have Mike Aruzzi on, the captain of that team that played in the 1980 Olympics for the U.S. I mean, like he said, everybody remembers the Soviet win. Um, you know, and there's a lot of people out there that forget that wasn't the gold medal game. Uh, but obviously, without that win, they weren't even going to be in in the medal game. So. Um, pretty cool to talk to Mike just to get a little bit of a background on the 1980 Olympics. I mean, we've all watched the movie. We've all heard about the, you know, the miracle on ice and, uh, you know, just epic, epic sporting event in our history in the U S and, you know, what better person to talk hockey with than the captain of that team and to get his perspective on it. And what a humble guy. Great to have him on the show. Uh, he's just still doing great things with hockey in Boston and, uh, you know, wish him the best of luck, and hopefully we can get him out on the golf course at uh, some point. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You know, look, I, for our listeners, people don't realize Lake Placid is like 2,900 people in the population. So, you yeah. know, when <laughs> Pat said in the beginning that, he, when, you know, it's true. I, I do the same thing. You know, if you've ever been to Lake Placid, there's two streets. The one you drive in on, you take a right, and that's the one you drive out on. And uh, you, you happen to go past the Olympic Arena, but again, it's a population of 2,900 people or so. You know, not much more than that. So it, it's very true for us hockey guys that have played in that uh, arena, and to be on the streets, you know, it's like. How the hell did they pack people in for that game, for that, you know, for that whole event? You know, it's just a, it's a wonder um, that they were able to, to even, you know, facilitate. Yeah, the, the stories go that, you know, they were – people were staying fans in Montreal. They were staying in Toronto. You know, Toronto to Lake Placid is a six, seven-hour drive. Montreal is, you know, five hour drive. They're staying in Syracuse, New York and getting bussed up there. Like Rob said, there's one way in and one way out. And it's not a two lane highway. We're talking uh, country road up to the mountains of the Adirondacks. And, you know, there's no way today, you know, Lake Placid is beautiful. Like you said, we've all been there. Our names are actually in the 1980. Uh, rank for winning uh, New York State championships. Um, so we're in there. We got a little bit of history we can put in there. But like I said, we played there. But I can't, I can't imagine back when the Olympics were there, um, how people got in and out staying in Toronto. Um, but it, it would be, <clears throat> it's a beautiful place, and to have the Winter Olympics there again would be amazing. But it's just not possible. It's so small. But in 1980, they did it. And uh, to have Mike on, like I said, we were, we've been to that rink. We played there. Uh, numerous tournaments. Rob's got a Can-Am hockey picture in the background. 
Um, they do a tournament every summer. There's always something going on in Lake Placid. Um, Olympians training, uh, hockey players. Um, I mean, top NHL draft picks go to Lake Placid for the summer to train uh, top-notch facilities. Um, so Lake Placid has like, it's kind of like we're part of Lake Placid um, just because, like I said, we've been there so much and to be able to actually talk with Mike tonight was you know, almost a dream come true. We did have Don Waddell on, who is the general manager of the Carolina Hurricanes. Um, he he, had, he almost had an opportunity to play in the Winter Olympics. He broke his leg. I think he was on, you know, a podcast in the uh, podcast like 87 or something. But, uh, yeah, that, it was a great podcast. I'm glad Mike came on. And uh, he's a good friend of uh, Jordan Greenway, my nephew. And uh, – so we're, we're glad and, and Jody Jody Anderson helped us uh, get him on the podcast. Also, I gotta give a shout out to her. Uh, she wrote a book on uh, hockey mom. So uh, thanks, Jody. I thought, yeah, I thought yeah. one of the coolest stories. Real quick, I thought one of the coolest stories about what he said was the night before the Russia game. How he they the state trooper picked him up, drove him ten to twelve miles out of town, which means you maybe he was in Saranac Lake or something, you know, or close to Saranac, maybe. Yeah. At a campsite, you know, at a campsite with his dad, you know, sitting around a campfire, probably having a couple pops. And then the then the state trooper drove him home. You know, I, I just, so like the trooper just kind of like hung out and waited until he was done. Yeah, for sure, yeah. and maybe had a couple of beers back in those days himself and then drove him home. But I, I don't know. Yeah, right. like, like you say, Pat, I mean, it's like we've been there. So like in my mind, like when he was talking about that, we've all played a bunch of hockey there, like you said. So my mind, we was talking about that. Um, I was like picturing myself in that area, you know, and like sitting around a campfire because I've done that up there, you know. So it's like, I don't know, it was, you know, it was like sucking me back in time or just like, you know, planting me in a in in that area and just uh, basically living living that moment with him. So I thought to me that was kind of like the coolest part of that interview was listening to him talk about the night before that Russia game and going up sitting with his dad. And I'm thinking about myself, like as a dad now, how cool that would be to to think back, you know, of your son before the game was sitting there having a beer with you and stuff like that. So I thought that was a really cool part of that interview. Yeah. Maybe, maybe some people won't look at it the same way, that portion of the interview, the way I did. But I, to me, that kind of like stuck with me a little bit. Yeah, I was talking to uh, my sure. father-in-law is here and uh, he was telling me, obviously, he was um, old enough. He's about 64 or so um, to go to those games. And he had tickets to the Russia game. And his wife didn't want to go, so he gave them to some buddies, and they watched the game at the St. Lawrence Inn instead. So, I mean, <laughs> I just said, how the fuck can you give that up? You know, like people took for granted about, you know, because it was so close yeah. to where we live, um, you know, and just not going up there and checking out the games. But uh, it was a different era back then. The Olympics were a lot different back then. There's there so much more of a, you know, show these days, the way it's put on and, the Olympics made Lake Placid what it is. Without the, the Olympics in Lake Placid, it's not the town that it is today, right? So, I mean, obviously, they put a lot of money into the town when the Olympics came in. It's become a huge tourist area for skiing and stuff like that as well. So, I mean, it's just a this this whole Olympics has transformed that, that little town. Sure. Yeah, I, I was going to say, um, we didn't ask him, but he, he produced a movie, um, you know, I, what what was the name of the movie? Is it Miracle on Ice or what was the name of the movie? The Miracle movie? on Ice, yeah. It was. Well, yeah. I, I actually played with one of the stars on on that uh, in that movie. His name's Eric Peter Kaiser. Uh, we called him Sunshine. Sunshine. He was this golden. I think he was from California or some shit like that. But um, uh, just you know, a pretty boy. He ended up leaving to go and being in a movie, a uh, hockey movie. So, you know, good for him. But uh, a miracle. Yeah. It was a miracle. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can't say enough about that interview, fellas. Um, you know, another great guest for the Blue Liners. Um, just to just to reminisce with him about the 1980 Olympics. What better person to have on the show to talk about it um, than Mike Ruzioni? I mean, he's like he said, what question hasn't he answered about the 1980 Olympics? And. Um, I can't imagine how many times he gets asked about it. So for him to come on this show and talk about it, that was really cool um, because I'm sure he's getting sick of the same questions over and over. But for him to take the time was, was, was awesome. You know, the funny yeah. thing is, Mark, is we were talking before, you know, about how everybody thinks uh, of that moment as if it was the gold medal moment. 
and it wasn't. And that was the first thing he said right off the bat. He goes, everybody, everybody thinks it, it, the Russian game was the gold medal. And, you know, if it wasn't for, uh, you know, playing, what was it, Finland? Finland? Uh, playing yeah. right now, yeah. If it wasn't for the Finland game, you know, they wouldn't even have gotten into the gold medal. So there's a whole story after, you know, that huge win. Um, it's, it's very cool. All right, boys, let's uh, talk a little bit about our sponsors tonight. We have um, two sponsors we want to plug tonight. We have Second String Leather. If you haven't checked them out, check out their their wallets, their belts, their bags, all their good stuff. Here's one of their wallets if you're watching on YouTube. Very cool stuff made out of all old uh, goalie pads that they've transformed into wallets and belts and keychains and tote bags and all kinds of cool shit that – uh, watch bands for your i wa- uh, your iPhone watches and all that kind of stuff. So check them out at second stretch second string leather dot com. Uh, really cool products. I also want to give a shout out to Belfour Spirits. Um, they sent us some really cool whiskey bottles that Eddie the Eagle Belfour has been uh, putting out on the market. So if you're looking for a good whiskey, if you're a whiskey or bourbon drinker, they've got a few different brands that they're pushing out. Um, of that product line now. So we just wanted to give them a shout out. Uh, definitely a good uh, sponsor of the program here at Elbows the Blue Line up, Hockey Club. Eddie. Elbows <laughs> up, Eddie. <laughs> Elbows up, Eddie. All right, boys. Uh, you know, let's get into a little around the rink, yeah. Patrick. Let's uh, see what yeah, we got I mean, this evening. The biggest news that I wanted to, uh, you know, announce before we even get into it is, uh, you know, Kobe Cave uh, passed away. He had uh, um, a brain aneurysm, I guess, Um, died at 25, played for the Edmonton Oilers. Just a young kid, you know, living the dream, Um, you know, just got married. Like I said, he's 25 years old and passed away. Um, It's unfortunate. Uh, You know, it only happens every once in a while, Uh, especially us. You know, we're a hockey-based podcast, and uh, to see him pass away was uh, – pretty sad and uh, you know Connor McDavid Connor McDavid said he's one of the toughest guys he knew um you know a bunch of other people said he just had great character uh he liked everyone helped everyone um just a great guy I, I did see a couple uh um social media feeds of him talking to the referees or the linesmen during a face off and just said you know how you doing tonight? You having a good night? And, you know, just, you know, shooting the shit, just being like, uh, you know, the average guy. And um, so rest in peace to Colby. Yeah. Cave. It sucks. Yeah. Just a l- little bit more on that is, you know, one of the, the hardest things that I read about that situation is that his family wasn't able to see him when he was in the hospital because of this COVID-19 bullshit. So, you know, they yeah. knew that he was struggling and might not make it and they wouldn't even let the family or wife go in to see him because of the, uh, the COVID-19. So, I mean, I can't imagine how hard that was for them to not be able to go yeah. in the hospital. Um, you know, when I, like 20 years ago, I had a teammate die on uh, Eric Sopacasa, the UMass lacrosse team, and he died in practice. And he's always been remembered by the program. And he still is to this day. They still wear a number 43, a black circle on their helmets. Um, we we wore like a black nice. band on our legs for years and years and years. And they they, uh, they still have him a big part of the program. So I think that we'll see something like that up in Edmonton where they remember him and that he's Definitely. going to be part of that program for a long time and, um, you know, remember him as that, an Edmonton. They might even put his jersey up in the rafters. Who knows? Yeah. A pretty cool thing I saw about Colby, um, yeah. you know, I, I watched uh, – I had to do a little bit of research because I didn't, I didn't know much about him, to be honest. Um. But I watched this one fucking fight of his, and he KO'd this guy. And uh, they showed text message, you know, right after, saying, hey, man, I hope you're okay. You know, I hate doing that, but, you know, just uh, reaching out to him to see if he was okay. It's a class act. It it just shows the character of this kid. Um, You know, fighting isn't, isn't a whole lot of fun. Some people love it. And some people just do it. And, uh, you know, he was a tough fucking kid. And it sounds like, you know, he just did it and did it well. But to reach out um, to the guy he knocked the fuck out, you know, that shows the class of his kid. He was, uh, uh, you know, obviously had character. Sure. 
All right. So uh, you want to get into around the rink now, Patrick, and uh, come up with the first question for us here? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think Rob's uh, got a really good topic tonight. Um, but what do you got, Pete? I was just uh, want. I just wanted to mention before we get into Pete's was uh, Bill Peters, uh, the uh, assistant coach of the Edmonton Oilers, got fired uh, for his comments that came back and kind of, um, you know, from when he coached back in the minors or whatever. Um, he's coaching the KHL now. Um, um, and uh, one funny thing was that I forget the team that he's coaching for, the Automobile. It's like an automobiles or something. I can't even name. say I the name. I, I couldn't even try to say the name. But the I, captain I, of the I, team is uh, Nigel Daw, uh, Dawes. I think that's how they say his last name. He played for the Rangers, D-A-W-E-S. I don't know if you Ranger fans know him. But uh, uh, he played, you know, yeah, played for the Canadians, Thrashers, Flames, Rangers, and a few other teams. Um, only two – I think there's two Canadians on the team. All the rest are uh, Russians, but you know, that's Bill Peters. You know, he's, he got fired in the NHL, assistant coach of the Edmonton Oilers uh, going to the K, you know, in two years, I, I would even bet the farm on it. You'll see him back as a head coach in the NHL. That's just almost like what they do. Um, but uh, yeah, that's just something I wanted to say, you know, say Bill Peters left, uh, Edmonton organization, and now he's coaching the KHL. But Rob's got a really good topic. Look, their morals are a little different over there. I can let well, shit slide. Got to go to purgatory for a couple of years. He'll be back. Yeah, before I <laughs> yeah. jump into my topic, I'll say I, I did see something on Bill Peters. Uh, you know, we, we talked about this. It's, yeah, it's, this is uh, – got Disclosure, this is Rob's uncle. Rob Peters, Bill Peters. But, same last name, yeah. Ken, no uh, Ken, yeah, Ken, Ken Paul. Um, look, uh, we already. talked about having second chances, and and I saw and an Brad. article that he said, you know, look, we're we're all growing, and um, you know, he's no different than anybody else. So I, I think he understands sure. that times are changing, and you know, I, I feel like uh, he knows um, he has to do better. So, yeah, we weren't going to bring it up, but Kyle Larson is in the same situation. He's a NASCAR driver, dropped the end bomb in a virtual uh, yeah. race this week and it lost all of his sponsors. And he was shit canned by his uh, race team and, and NASCAR. So it's not just hockey. It's across the board. I mean, you got to you can't be doing I that shit. Skittles, Coke, Pepsi, Cola, <laughs> drive safe food, Pepsi, Cola, car. Yeah. I want to so thank big, everyone who came out and did it. So basically now he's like uh, – I want to thank the Ku Klux Klan, and that's about it, because they've all dropped the desk. All right, boys, um, let's get into Robbie's topic here. Um, go ahead, Rob. Let's let's see what you got, buddy. I want to thank Marlboro, Scowl, <laughs> Winston. Yeah, so my around the ring topic is going to be uh, about the rookies that would typically be coming into the NHL after they, you know, they finish up the college season, um, and you know, this class of just Pity missing season. out. Well, Pity season, I mean, yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. it's, you know, you got these guys like Kale McCarr who, you know, is on the uh, uh, Colorado Avalanche who I picked to win the Stanley Cup this year. And, you know, what if, you know, unfortunately, um, you know, we got this coronavirus, uh, COVID-19, you know, there's been 18 of them before this one. Um, so, you know, I don't know. <laughs> No, but Kale McCarr, I mean, he could have won the Stanley Cup. I mean, it is a rookie season, and he could have been on, you know, a top, you know, up with these top names of, you know, Pavel Bure, uh, Patrick Waugh, uh, Cam Ward in, uh, here in Carolina, um, Raleigh. Cam Ward won the Stanley Cup as a rookie. Um, just so many names that uh, um, could have happened. Yeah, Gretzky, but, you know, Merrill Lemieux. All these guys were sensational rookies, and you know some of them are, are missing their opportunity to shine. Yeah, and sure. just to touch on uh, the college kids coming into the game, end of the season, like you had Kale McCarr come in from UMass at the end of the year and play um, with the Avalanche in the playoffs. You had Jordan Greenway do the same thing after the Olympics, um, and then he went to playoffs, and then he went to the NHL all in one season. 
I think it's the only person to ever do that. But, you know, the first the, person the, ever. The, the, yeah, the only person to ever do that. It's very cool, right? So you got these other kids, though, they're coming out of the, the college and wherever they're coming out of their season has ended and they get a chance to go play at the end of the NHL season. You know, correct me if I'm wrong, Pat, but that gives them a chance to burn one of their entry-level years, right? So, yeah, so if you sign late in the year, let's, you know, like uh, Jordan did, um, yeah, you can burn a year. So you only play 10 games, 12 games uh, that first year is over Huge. with. So, um, yeah, so technically, and th- but the biggest thing is they don't count that as your rookie season. So um, your rookie season is after you sign that contract. So if you play, you know, 15 games or you play two games, uh, you're – your next, your full season is technically your rookie year. Um, but yeah, you can burn a year, which is great for these players because, you know, uh, NH, NHL is the only like, you know, professional sport where you get an entry level after, in it's that, three years. I, I don't know if, it, yeah, for three years. And then after that, it's uh, your restricted free agent usually. Yeah. And then you become a, a free so, agent. So yeah. Like Kale McCarr, he comes in, burns a year last year. So now he's got this season, next season, then he's signing a, a big deal, you know, like, and that's, yeah, yeah and I mean, he's going to go for 900,000 to millions, right? So that one yeah. season was huge for him, those 10 games. So, and then put then put a Stanley Cup on his resume, right? And then go, go to the table, the round table, you and your agent, well, the players don't go to the round table, the agent does, and, and you know, there were, Kale McCarr's agent, you know, he's got a, a chew in and he brings a, a fucking Slurpee from the 7-Eleven and puts it on the table and said, let me hear what you got to say, boys. He's a fucking Stanley Cup winner. You know what I mean? And now now they don't have that. They don't yeah. have that collateral now. Well, well so, so I'm specifically talking about the Hobie Baker winner, Scott Perunovich. Uh, you know, North Dakota, uh, we don't know if they were going to win the national title. Cornell was number one. We don't know if Cornell was going to win, but, you know, a guy like this Scott per- Perunovich and, and even Jeremy Swayman, we had Swayman on, you know, these guys could have maybe had a chance to come up and, and show what they were, you know, possibly yeah. contribute. Playoff push. Jordan and, Byington's the epitome, right? Byington last year. Yeah, we just don't know anymore. It's just a, yeah. you guys, it's a, this is a microcosm, though. I mean, like, this is fucking everything. I mean, the, this COVID-19 has taken away. I mean, you can't even begin to, to like, start as to how much this has taken away from, you know, just your average college athlete to your average college oh. uh, enrollee. You know what I mean? Like, people that just want to be a senior and have fun, you know, like, they're screwed out of that. You know, these hockey players are going to be screwed out of money. Football players are going to be screwed out of money. Uh, people won't go in the draft where they're supposed to go because the season was cut short. I mean, the the amount of financial loss and, you know, like personal and emotional and uh, whatever loss you can come up with is just exponential. I can't even – this is crazy. I mean, I, I was sitting driving around the other day uh, coming back from my office, and I was thinking to myself, like, about this almost exact thing and about how much this little virus has stripped away from – you know, not so much even me as, a, you know, a person that's older, but I, I feel so bad for younger people, you know, that were in college, that are student athletes, that are, you know, maybe about to get a payday or something. It's just crazy. You know, you got the NFL draft coming. Like, those guys are never going to get to shake the commissioner's hand and put a hat on. And, you know, it's yeah. it's, it's 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 fucking unbelievable, honestly, how much this thing is is has rocked our world. So, it's – I don't Definitely know. It's crazy. It's a good – it's a really good topic, Rob, because – even though we're talking yeah. about yeah, yeah. Even though we're ta- yeah, even though we're talking about hockey, I mean, this goes across the spectrum of sports, goes across the spectrums of just humanity in general about what this has stripped yeah, I mean, and taken away and everything else. So, yeah, college scholarships, um, unbelievable. You just go on and on. I mean, it it just it sucks, you know. But you know, keeping it to keeping it to hockey, I mean it sucks for all the rookies that, you know, had the potential that were going towards the uh, Calder trophy uh, as a rookie to win that. So, you know, to me, and it, we can go off tangent real quick. I mean, real quick, we don't have to elaborate on it, but to me personally, as a hockey fan, I don't, 
I don't think they should play the NHL this year because I I don't think I don't think it's a true season, right? So to me, you know, I think Colorado. Um, we can get we can throw the Bruins in there. I'm going West Coast, East Coast. Um, the Bruins have an old team, right? So can those boys get their legs back? Fucking Chara's 43. Let's say they start in two weeks. I mean. The Bruins could lose like Tampa did last year, fucking just right out of the first round. Colorado's young. I don't know. It's a big tangent. You can debate it, but uh, it's it sucks. I mean, it sucks from the NCAA to uh, NHL, yeah. all pro sports, baseball, football, <laughs> tennis, fucking hot. I think it's a, good, it's a good point, Pat, though, because I think Drew Doughty was out this week or, you know, last week or, you know, recently, and he, he mentioned, you know, that, even if the even if the season comes back, I mean, does the cup mean what it normally means? I mean, is there just a big asterisk on it? You know, like I don't, I don't, I don't know. So. You know, it's like nobody won the regular season. How do you like nobody really won the regular season? So do you just put them in the playoffs and then, you know, it just seems like a fruit the same Louis Blues. Yeah, the Blues like last year were in the last place. Yeah, yeah. 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 so it doesn't. You don't have that. It's it doesn't have the proper trajectory going into the playoffs and yeah. I don't know. I mean, it. it this, you know, fucking COVID-19 has fucked everything up. So, I mean, this is just... I just yeah. yeah. My, my perspective on this is just that, you know, unless you're the Red Wings or the, the Senators, which you might as well just fucking play golf anyway, right? Why even thinking about playing yeah. more hockey? But I don't think they should come back and play the playoffs. You know, if, if they're going to start yeah. the season, I would like them to, you know, play the rest of the season, give the teams the opportunity to make the wild card push, um, you know, play a real season. I mean, if you're going to put, they're talking about pushing the, the next 2021 20, season back to November to give it time to, to play out. And I think the best thing is to play the season up and, and just play a regular playoffs and push the next season back a little bit. I mean, it's not fair to anybody just to start a playoffs, right? I don't think that's, I think that's bullshit. I mean, and as far as the, the college kids, you got the Hobie Baker winner about to go play in the NHL make uh, $10,000 a game and now he's going to get a $1,200 stimulus check. Right. So <laughs> at least he's getting something. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's awful, man. I, it's just, I, I think they should just end it next year. Just call it a wash. It sucks for like uh Koivu, you know, we were wild fans, um, you know, for him, his last season, it might be good for him. He fucking was awful uh, <laughs> excuse for him to hang him up. But some of these guys that that um, you know wanted to you know maybe get another year, Joe and um, Marlo, Patrick Marlo, um, some of Howard. these guys that you know had another. Jimmy Howard is a great example. Uh, these guys that had another you know year or two, you know, wanted to make that bank account a little bit better, put an extra you know one two million dollars in there for retirement at. 33 fuckers. Um, but now, now they can't, right? So it, it's tough. You know, um, one team that I think we forget about is the Philadelphia Flyers. They had come yeah, out of Carter Hart. They, were, they were coming on fire and then just had to stop. So, yeah. you know, it's got to be tough. But, you know, that's part of why I got into that with Jerome McGinley last week. You know about the horse races i didn't get to follow up but i wanted to say well did you want to comment on the fucking tampa bay lightning you know because he wanted to be the the, the main the, the front horse in that whole scenario yeah and you know look being the front front horse doesn't mean you're going to win the fucking Stanley cup yeah still i like the win. underdog situation myself always good to go in as an underdog yeah, so I, I didn't get to follow up, but, you know, of course you want to be the main horse. You want to show off your fucking goods all year long. You want to be in the front winning all the fucking, you know, all the side trophies and everything. But, you know, you still have to win the Stanley Cup. And Tampa Bay being the first horse, they lost in the first round of playoffs. They got swept out of the fucking, you know, the playoffs. Yeah, and I can relate to that because I was in the NHL uh, playing for Sergis. Uh -huh. We were the top team going into the uh, playoffs, and we lost. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, pretty pretty big men's league. Um, yeah, yeah. Like four teams. Penalty unit. Mm -hmm. um, so. All right, well, next anyway. uh, 
Next topic, boys, and around the rink, Derek, you got something for us this week? Have you actually been able to find anything in the fucking sports world to talk about? No, well, when's the, uh, when's the draft? And if, or NFL? This, this, it's this week, man, coming up. So uh, it's going to be a virtual draft. You know, uh, they're going to be – they had people come in, you know, and they had some stuff Is on NFL. Friday? Thursday and Friday. It starts on Thursday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So tomorrow. Uh, Thursday, Friday. No, 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 next week, next week. Oh, next week. Okay. Yep. So it starts next week, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Um, it'll be, you know, a virtual draft. The, you know, these teams have, you know, the GMs and stuff are going to be in their own homes. Uh, all the coaches and everything will be remote. You know, maybe there'll be, you know, coaches and stuff might be in the facility. I have no idea, but obviously they'll be sitting six feet apart sure. and all that cool. shit. But um, they'll, uh, yeah. So that, that's going on this week. I mean, that's at least a return to uh, somewhat of normalcy, maybe. That'll give some people a peace of mind, maybe. It'd give me a peace of mind to watch uh, the Chiefs draft okay. another uh, few players and win another Super Bowl this year. So that'll be nice to watch. Um, hey. Yeah, that's. Yeah, it's, us, it, we won't have to beat her wife every night. We can. Yeah, I mean, we take off, one you know. night off from kicking her in the. Yeah, but uh, that's not all you're beating. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so I mean, that's one you know, sporting event. That's maybe maybe it's the uh, tip of the iceberg, right? To uh, kind of get us back to normalcy. I see golf maybe is coming back, um, maybe in June. Which I, think I mean, fuck, oh, you're sorry. out in the middle of the fucking no. I mean, you don't have to have fans for golf. You know, I mean. Can't make any noise anyway. Three guys, yeah, three guys can stay. You know, three times two is six with the caddy. Those guys can stay six feet apart. Give us something on TV. You know, it's just exactly Pat. Give us something to watch. Give Give America something to friggin' look at other than you know, I don't know Andrew Cuomo flexing his muscles on TV or something, but. The Blue it's Line just, Hockey Club podcast on YouTube. The Blue Line Hockey Club podcast, yeah. And I mean, it's I don't know. This is a crazy world we're living in. We need we need something to give us. We need some sports, man. We need sports in our life. Blue yeah, and people are people are playing life. golf here every day. I mean, my dad went and played golf with the. He plays every Wednesday. They play today. Uh, they got to take a. You know, there's two of them playing. They had to take two carts. They can't be in the same cart. But I mean, it's happening. As far as none of the courses are closed down here. Um, you know, so people are playing golf. Why can't the pros play? Yeah, we're well, they're playing here in North Carolina. A lot more people that are involved in an event. I understand that, but I mean, yeah. at some point, when do we get back well, to normalcy? I guess. Personally, obviously, we want that stuff to happen, but you know, for the NFL draft and, and for the PGA, or you know, well, we missed Augusta, but for the PGA to pick back up, it's like. You know, is there really going to be a – should we put an asterisk on this? I mean, what is this like when there's no fans, right? These guys are used to taking tee shots with thousands of people lined up on the sides of them. I mean, they're they're shooting over the top of everybody, and, and now there's just – You would kill people. Around. Well, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> we all I'm not on the PGA Tour either. <laughs> yeah, but I oh, think sorry, this is – this is pushed out to July or June, right? June? June. A June return? Mm-hmm. June. So, I mean, this is a whole fucking month and a half around. away. I mean, by then they might even have spectators, you know. It's all kind of a week to week. We're not going to have spectators, Mark. I mean, the, the way it works is. Okay, uh, doctor. And I won't bother everybody, but, you know, we, we can't get back to normal <laughs> until we have a vaccine. I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't know. That's, that's arguable. What? what? One topic I just wanted to bring up is the, the NHL um, possible neutral site, uh, which kind of confused me when I first heard that for all the listeners. Um, you know, one thing is, you know, maybe they didn't want to play in hot zones like New York MSG. Um, the other thing was, I think uh, we talked about it, was just, you know, playoff formats, um, not playing at, you know, the wilds why why are we playing here and not there so they're picking a neutral site um so that was kind of weird to me i i i don't, I don't know how they would do that i i guess they would have to base it off the regular season i i, I don't know why they just gary batman came out and said we would we would play the games at neutral sites what do you guys think yeah, I don't know either. I think one thing we talked about is uh, is if they play out in North Dakota, how much COVID-19 is going on out there. Is that, you know, trying to get away from the hotbeds, not, you know, in New York and 
some of these other cities that are infested with this disease, maybe they're trying to say, well, if we play out here where there's hardly any of it and everybody gets tested before right. we go there, you know, is this a safe place to play? I mean, that's the only thing I can think of, but I, mean, I don't know why you would go play in yeah. some rinky-dink fucking arena for the NHL. Or with an art park. Yeah. I mean, they have glass or chicken wire? Yeah. Well, they got, uh, what's the restaurant there? Savarios? Or <laughs> that right was close. All those Seven. places have probably never reopened. We know. <laughs> Seven. Seven. There you go. There you go. All right, boys. Uh, I think we've got enough of the round of the rink tonight. It's, uh, you know, sometimes it's pulling teeth for us on the podcast to come up with topics with no sports going on, but we try to do a good job of getting something to you guys, something interesting to talk about, to banter on the Blue Line Hockey Club. But also, we bring you top-notch interviews every week, like uh, getting the last week, Michael Rizzioni this week, and many more to come. So keep checking us out on our website, bluelinehockeyclub.com, uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and obviously one of the biggest places to watch our podcast now is on YouTube. Um, so if you're somebody that likes to watch the, the podcast, get on YouTube. We've got almost 100 videos on there that you can watch of our past, past, uh, past podcast. So check out YouTube for all of our new and upcoming stuff and also on social media. All right, boys, another great That's interview. Mickey Mouse podcast, everybody. And this isn't a Mickey Mouse, motherfucker. All right, boys, <laughs> until next time, keep your stick on the ice. Yeah, yeah. Toodle. Oh, doctor. Yeah. Keep your head up.